Welcome to Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, the podcast that deals with all things mental health. We talk to professionals, survivors, and loved ones about their sometimes informative, sometimes uplifting, and sometimes tragic stories. I'm your host of the show, Todd Rennebaum, advocate, recovering addict, experienced sufferer of depression and anxiety, and author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health here on the Saskatchewan Podcast Network, the network that is full of Saskatchewan-made podcasts. I am Todd Rennebaum. Now, I just want to thank everybody for listening. If it's your first time listening, thank you. If it's your 30th, if it's your 200th time listening, that would be weird because there's only about 35 episodes, but thank you. If you still, thank you. The podcast is currently number six on the top 10 best mental health Canadian podcasts. That's a mouthful. So yeah, that's, um, that's very exciting. Now, uh, if you could just do me a huge favor for, for me, for this free podcast, if you could just pause and go and rate the, the podcast on Apple and, uh, I believe you can do it on Spotify too. Just give it a quick five stars or, you know, four and three quarter stars and then hit play again. I'll wait. Actually, I don't have to wait. You'll be pausing. So thank you for that. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Pim Chews, Pim Mood Chews. They help with your anxiety. You start to feel a little anxiety. You pop one of these little chewy gummy things and chew it all up. And it, there's no, it's not cannabinoids or anything. It's uh, amino acids. And uh, it's a really wonderful little chew that helps with your anxiety. Uh, and that's Pim, P-Y-M, Chews. Just go to you can Pim dot com and order yours there this episode is also brought to you by penny university bookstore 3104 13th avenue in regina or you can go to penny u.ca and order your books right there and speaking of books you can order my book sometimes daddy cries which is a child's book about a boy watching his father have depression okay on with the show quickly next week uh, my special guest, her name is Rachel, and she's from Scotland. And at one point in her life, she didn't leave her house for four years, other than to quickly walk her dog and to maybe go to a doctor's appointment. It's about different phobias that she had and, you know, the agoraphobia, which is fear of leaving your house. Uh, it's a really good interview. She's a really sweet lady. And I really look forward to uh, releasing that one. So stay tuned next week. This week, I'm speaking to David Pope. He is from London, uh, London, England. And David is a grief counselor. Uh, I've been wanting to do an episode about grief for a long time. And so this is it. Uh, I met David on Instagram. And, uh, I, you know, I actually reached out to a couple counselors and therapists locally and no one really returned my messages so I was following David on Instagram and I sent him a message and you know we're doing it over zoom anyway so I could talk to whoever I want wherever I want not whenever I want but wherever I want and so he was kind enough to do that and he is uh, just the most gentle sweetest man I've ever talked to so I I, I can't wait for you to hear this uh, there's coping mechanisms and we talk about guilt, we talk about shame, we talk about all types of stuff and uh, anger around grief. So without further ado, I give you David Pope. Well, I think that grief can trigger mental illness. So in other words, it can, it can trigger depression, it can trigger anxiety, and it can certainly trigger anger. And ironically, anger is one of the coping mechanisms for grief. Hmm. So, and it's actually, in, interestingly, it's also one of the coping mechanisms for mental illness in, in quite a few strategies, because if you are depressed and you can't get out of bed, sometimes you need to have that kind of 
iron will to get yourself out of bed and sort of stand up for yourself. And that can show up as anger. So if you're really fed up of your situation, you're fed up of the suffering and the struggles and feeling this way, sometimes you can actually use anger to drive you on and to spur you on. Hmm. So it's interesting how there's so much crossover between the coping mechanisms that work for grief and the coping mechanisms that work for mental illness. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I did do an episode on anger, but um, we didn't touch on that, that it's actually a coping mechanism in a way that it, it actually drives people to move, to go forward with life. Yeah. I, the way, the way it often works to your advantage is, for instance, let's say you are struggling with a relationship issue or maybe even an estrangement or you're struggling with you know, depression and you're, you've been struggling for a considerable amount of time. You can get to a stage where you say one morning, you just say, I've had enough. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this anymore. And what, what that anger does is it's kind of like you're showing up for yourself. You're finally standing up for yourself. Mm. Because especially um, I've, I've, I've seen cases where, you know, you might have an estrangement between two people and it will make one of those people feel a certain way or it will uh, create an immense amount of struggle for them. And sometimes I'll work with them and say, right, let's now focus on you and how you can stand up for yourself, how you can actually uh, be the warrior for yourself. So anger can be a beautiful thing. It can, it can be empowering. Hmm. Now, obviously, you know, that's what I would call constructive anger. So just losing with someone on the street or uh, dis- displaying anger just for the sake of anger, no, that's... That's not what I would call constructive and and productive anger, mm. but it's something that's just not talked about. You know, we we all view anger pretty much like we view grief. We view it as a bit of a kind of stigma. You know, you mustn't get angry and you mustn't cry and and all these kind of deep rooted deep emotions are actually the ones that we need to feel. Mm. So it's almost like you're moving on. You're, you're, so the anger, what I'm trying to say here, I, I think I know exactly what you mean because I think I've done it before where I've had coworkers that were basically trying to get me to quit. And it was almost like I used my anger like as spite. It's like, I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stay here as long as I can to spite them. <laughs> you know, or I'm, so it's like, I've been so depressed for so long. I'm going to get my, my shit together out of spite for my depression or my grief yeah it, it's a kind of it's the attitude that I, i'm not going to take this anymore and you right. know that's when we're talking about boundaries so you have those inner boundaries and you have the external boundaries so the inner boundaries are the way we speak to ourselves mm. so the constant self-blame self-criticism beating beating oneself up coming down hard on oneself. That's all the sort of internal inner boundary talk, inner dialogue. But the external boundaries is how we relate to others. So for instance, if you've got a bully in the workplace or you've got somebody who's trying to gaslight you or trying to manipulate you, Mm -hmm. then your anger, but again, being constructive with it, is a way of you saying, no, I'm not having this. I'm not accepting it. It's the same in relationships, you know, within relationships, it's so common for family members, friends, colleagues to invalidate, to be unsupportive, whether you're going through mental illness, whether you're going through grief and undermining your feelings, undermining your struggles. It's so common. It's so incredibly common. No loneliness, loneliness and isolation is, is huge amongst the grieving community and it's huge amongst the mental illness community. So what the anger does is it says, do you know what? I, I'm going to find the people to support me. I'm going to find 
I'm going to assign this person to support me for this. I'm going to find this person to support me in this way. And if this person wants to behave the way they're behaving, and if they want to not support me, fine. That's fine. That's the prerogative. But I'm looking after number one. Here. So again, it's really powerful when you do feel that emotion. You know, you have to kind of, when, when you start standing up for yourself and you start saying, I'm not taking this anymore, it, it's very, very powerful. And it works across the spectrum. It works, as I say. I mean, grief is obviously, grief is grief. I mean, grief, you just have to, you have to feel your grief. It takes a long time to process. You know, it takes years and years to just digest what's happened in your reality. But with depression, for instance, you know, somebody has got clinical depression or somebody has got severe depression, it's very controlling. It takes over your entire life and it stops you doing so many things that you want to do because it's the constant negative voices and it's the constant um, feeling of, of dark clouds and, and overwhelm. And what can be a really powerful strategy is to kind of find that inner strength and force yourself to do the things that are going to help you. Now, it's obviously easier said than done, but mm -hmm. then again, going back to the emotion of anger, sometimes you need to get angry with yourself. You need to say, come on, let's do this. Let's, I'm not going to struggle anymore. So it's, it's very interesting how the things that we think are getting in the way of our recovery can actually facilitate it. You always hear about the stages of grief and anger is one of them. Is there, is there something to that? Is there actual uh, levels of grief or, you know, step one is, I can't remember what it is, you know, accept, and then ultimately it's acceptance. Is there some truth behind that, that old saying? So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with this model, this uh, grief process model where you have the shock and you have the denial and you have the digestion, the processing, and you have the anger and you have the depression and you have the guilt and you have the acceptance. Hmm. Now she, she was well ahead of her time. I mean, um, I've got a lot of time for, for her theories and her models and she kind of paved the way for better understanding of grief and how it works. But <laughs> two things. The first thing I would say is that there, there have been other models that, that have come to the, to the forefront of the grief world since then. But the first thing I would say is that grief is not as simple as that. It's not as linear as that. So mm -hmm. the, the journey of grief isn't just, all right, shock, okay, done that. Denial, yeah, okay, I'm over denial now. <laughs> okay, so the way it works is that you fluctuate and you go from one to the other, backwards and forwards. You take two steps forward, you take one step back, then you take three steps forward, and then you take six steps back. So it's a very volatile journey full of incredibly intense emotions. Uh, the, the, the basic framework, the basic model, yeah, sure, you do go through all, all those stages. You know, everyone's grief experience is so unique. So you've got somebody who, for instance, had a great relationship with their parents, right? So they will, you know, go through the stages they go through. They will grieve. Um, let's say, you know, there were no complications and uh, the, the parents, you know, passed at a good old age, etc. cetera, you know, and the standard sort of, and the deep love that you know the child felt for the parents is then then transitions into deep grief but you have a lot of situations where for instance maybe the relationship was dysfunctional right mm -hmm. maybe there was abuse maybe there was neglect maybe there was abandonment so what do you do now well you have now something called complex grief or complicated grief there's various terminologies that's the type of grief where you get stuck so you'll get stuck at different emotions because the processing is such a challenge 
because you don't really know what to make of the grief. You don't know what to make of the loss. Because on the one hand, you know, you've lost a loved one. But on the other hand, the relationships were fraught with issues. So very often, those cases, I see people and I'll ask them, you know, when did you lose your loved one? And they'll say, 10 years ago. I say, oh, right, okay. Hmm. And on, I'll, I'll initially, I'll think, oh, right, and you know, you're, you're coming to me now with that. Let's, 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 let's explore that. And it's normally as a result of just having an inability to grieve, hmm. an inability to shed physical grief, the tears, and just kind of being numb with it. And, and often that would equate to having to sort of work through a lot of the complicated aspects of the relationship that you had, you know, with the person you've lost. So there are, yeah, there are so many different, so many different types that you obviously got uh, people who've lost loved ones through tragic circumstances, through circumstances that most people are not, are not going to experience. Hmm. And those, those, those grief journeys are again, extremely complex because how do you make sense of what's happened in this tragic circumstance? You know, if you take my situation, I, I lost my parents to cancer. Now, obviously, you know, it, it, I mean, it was, it was tragic for me. It was, it was an enormous loss. It took everything out of me and it took me years and years to re recover from it as I was very close to my parents and they were young, you know, they're in their sixties, but you might have somebody who loses a child. Mm -hmm. You might have somebody who, you know, loses someone to homicide, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you have those kind of tragic circumstances, how can you possibly make sense of that? How can you possibly get your head around what's happened to your loved one, right? Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen is, you know, whereas you sort of go through that, you know, those, those as we talked about, those, those sort of, consistent emotions such as the anger and the guilt, etc. With the circumstances where something unusually tragic has happened, you're just kind of stuck with what to feel. And it's very, very hard to shift. But that's when counseling comes into play because what a good counselor will do is they will they will guide you kind of through the process of having to allow your grief and how to access those feelings because they're there, but they're deeply buried. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, another reason I guess that I wanted to do this episode is because through the podcast, I've talked to a lot of people who have lost loved ones to addiction and to suicide. Uh, and I, I'm assuming there's, there's probably more guilt associated with tragic loss than there is, uh, say, you know, your your parents dying of old age or something like that. So I don't know, maybe maybe touch on the guilt part of a of a tragic loss. And and I know this is tough because not only is everyone different, but every relationship is different and every uh situation that they're lost is different. So <laughs> I know this is a very general thing we're covering here, but I, I do appreciate it. So with guilt there are two things to think about. The first thing is that, you know, the most, the most common thing I hear is I should have. So I should have been there. I should have saved them. If I would have done this, then, you know, they, this wouldn't have happened, right? That's mm -hmm. the first sort of common thing I hear. Uh, the second thing to talk about with guilt is for someone who's also quite far down their grief journey. So someone who's you know, lost a loved one and it's been a number of years. And what it is, is that they're kind of in a battle with themselves in terms of letting go, letting go of the, of the intense grief, the, the intense part of the grief. Because grief never goes. Grief never expires. It's always there, but you change your relationship to the pain, you change your relationship to the grief. But the battle that a lot of grievers go through in the later stages is that they'll start feeling guilty for letting go of mm -hmm. the intensity. Right. Because they'll see that 
as a disservice to the person they've lost. So if I'm letting go of the pain, then I'm not honoring my parents' name or my sibling's name or my child's name or my partner's name. That's that's the way the mind mind works. Mm-hmm. In in my son's case, it's it's our dog. He's 17 years old and the dog passed f- five months ago and he's still, like when I bring him up, it's I can almost see his, his mind thinking that, you know, oh, I haven't thought about him for a while, so now I feel guilty, so now I have to get in that deep pain again. So anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And that's a really good point. And interestingly, lo- losing an animal can be really intense grief. It yeah. really can. Um, you know, my second relationship, second marriage, and my my previous relationship, my my uh, elder children uh, have a have a dog. I'm really attached to the dog, and I will be a mess when you know. So. <laughs> uh, a lot of people underestimate just how close, you know, because they, they are like a member of the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, there are a lot of people who, who, do, who can't understand that. They can't, they don't validate that because they think that, oh, you know, it's just a dog, but it's not. It's, um, it's, it's a rid because, you know, a, a dog's love is unconditional. Mm-hmm. A dog is always there for you. And uh, yeah, the, the, there's, uh, they, they don't have bad days, you know, they, yeah, the, the green with losing a dog can be really, really intense, but, um, yeah, I was just going to, uh, I know we just remind me of, um, where we were talking about, we about guilt, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And I tend to do too. that. I tend to drift off a bit. So, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing is that when we, when we lose a loved one, the, we, 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 we self blame, you know, and also another thing we do is that if the relationship wasn't as idyllic as we would have wanted it to be, we also try to relive that as well. We try to undo maybe a lot of the, maybe the rows you had or maybe some of the issues you had in the relationship. And so sometimes, yeah, that again, that's our way of trying to make sense and trying to make good of the past because what we do grieving is we need to draw a line to move on. We need to somehow, to be able to let go and to be able to move on. Now, they call it the before and the after. So before the loss and after the loss. And But before, before moving on to the sort of second part of your life after the loss, you have to somehow make good with the past. And that does involve having to ensure that you've done everything possible, that you've you were the best partner, son, parent, sibling. It's interesting because, again, similarly with anger, people can view guilt very negatively. Mm-hmm. But actually, it's part of the process. It's needed because it's your way of making sense of things. And what happens eventually is the messages that you, that you give yourself, you know, like, I should have done more or... I should have been there or uh, eventually they, you know, they transition and they, and, and as you say, that acceptance comes through. I always like to call it reluctant acceptance hmm. because if I were to say to somebody who's, I don't know, lost, lost their partner or lost their child, I said, right, you have to accept it. They're going to look at me with daggers. So it's not a question of acceptance it's a question of tolerance. It's a question of I'm reluctantly going to have to accept this because I have no choice. Whereas when you say acceptance, it can conjure up, you know, this, this idea of, okay, well I'm accepting it now, but it's obviously that's not the case. Mm -hmm. What does treatment look like for, well, I guess, again, there's all types of grief. Actually, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll pick a type of grief. That complex grief where you lose a parent or a sibling or something that you have um, that they either abused you or manipulated you or uh, that would be tough because it's because like you are losing a loved one. So do you feel guilt for feeling grief or do you feel guilt for not feeling grief 
or you know what I mean like how, how do you treat well well even that person you said that was came in after 10 years of losing their loved one what what, what does treatment look like is it like a cognitive behavioral therapy kind of stuff or is it uh, like a whole different genre of of therapy well the first thing that the griever has to get their head around is that whatever you're feeling is okay hmm. so it's very important to communicate especially in the early stages of therapy that there is no grief rule book you don't come in and have a bunch of tick boxes that you have to you have to fill this and you have to fill that and you have to fill the other it doesn't work that way and so the first thing is to understand the concept of whatever you're feeling is what you're feeling now very often somebody in a situation you've described who is getting very frustrated with how they're feeling because that's normally synonymous with somebody who has lost a loved one the relationship was compromised with issues or maybe it was dysfunctional and they are just completely stuck in the middle they don't know what to feel so the feeling of sort of not knowing what to feel is synonymous with somebody who's uh, been in a uh, who's lost somebody where the relationship you know had issues so mm. after sort of you know exploring their past their past history the relationship the emotions that came up for them in childhood and and in the relationship because you know our parents are the first relationship we have in the world right mm -hmm. and so they create a road map for the rest of our lives and so exploring those relationships normally reveals so much and so i think i i would explore those relationships very very intently and from there sort of explore you know whether any past traumas or existing traumas and in the end it's just about sort of building up a picture of why this person feels the way they do what are they feeling so the first the first step is to identify let's talk about what emotions are showing up for you mm. you know are you struggling to feel anything okay if that's the case, let's talk about that. Let's talk about why, what, what, how, why have you arrived at that point, and what's happened in the past. And again, if you're talking about uh, what it's very, very common is uh, somebody will lose their parent. The relationship was, you know, had, had issues, and the, the child is just trying to sort of it ha has that sort of intense feeling of guilt that they're not, you know, they're not feeling the grief. And I think it's just communicating that actually, you know, you, you have to allow whatever is, 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 is true, is whatever is actually revealing itself authentically. You know, what are you, what are you authentically feeling? And, and to say that it's okay, that if you, if, you, if you don't have this intense feeling of pain and, and isolation, it's okay because grief shows up differently for everybody. Mm. But most, in most cases, there is pain and it's, it's below the surface. And sometimes it just takes half, half a counseling session to actually unlock it because everything's about communication. Everything is about who you're communicating with. So actually when I lost my parents, I, I saw two or three different grief counselors because I just didn't, I didn't connect. And so if that connection's established, then the person who's lost uh, the loved one can, it, it's easier for them to access those emotions because the other person gets them. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of wrote down a thing here. Um, what about the situation where you lose someone and you're, you're trying to grieve, but someone else, whether it's a parent or a sibling or a loved one, they're grieving so much that you're actually helping them through their grief and they're, you know, I mean, they're taking all the attention from everyone because they're so devastated. And then, you know, it, it almost feels like maybe 
you're you're not being justified to to be able to grieve around them because <laughs> they're consuming all the the energy from everyone for their grief. Does that make sense? Is that something that's a thing? <laughs> I tell you what's very common, and that's you know grief really affects relationships. Mm-hmm. Really affects relationships. So you know the cause of so many divorces and so many relationship breakups is that when you experience a trauma in your life, it changes you. Mm. And then the question begs, how's, how's your partner going to deal with that? How are they going to deal with it? And how are they going to be there for you? Are they going to be able to be there for you? And it's, it creates a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on relationships especially when, for instance, a couple lose a child. Mm-hmm. And that puts an enormous amount of pressure on, on the couple. Right. Something else that's very common is, for instance, timing. So very often, you know, you, if, say, uh, one person within the family has, 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 had a, has had a loss, it affects everybody, right? It affects the whole family dynamic. Mm-hmm. And you might find that, one person's grieving and, and really feeling that intense grief at one o'clock in the afternoon. And then they recover and they come through it and they come back to a bit of normality. And, but then at four o'clock, somebody else is now taking on a, a, a whole bunch of intense emotions. So timing is, can be really tricky because then that creates pressure in the relationship because one person is, is, frustrated with the other for putting them in a, in a, in a, in a kind of depressed mood. So, you know, how we are affects a whole household or it affects the person you're living with, or it affects your work colleagues or it affects your peers. So emotions are like a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that, that is very, very common. You might have um, somebody who, you know, has a completely different grief journey to the other, but they're in, they're within the same kind of unit. They're in the same either social circle or they're in the same family. One person is on the way to moving on, but the other person is stuck and can't stop grieving. That creates pressure. The other thing I would say to your other point about the, what I call the physical grief. So the shedding of tears, I've, I've come across a lot of clients who, who, who just can't, they can't, stop with you know the the physical grief it just they have no control over it and as i said not all the time but sometimes it's because they've just got stuck they've just got stuck at the processing and the and the digestion of of the loss and very often with some therapy to just enable them to navigate what's showing up they can they can move through that. Um, it take you know. I say it, it takes time. Hmm. Yeah, you know, just that just made me think of that. Yeah. Uh, has there ever been anyone that you couldn't help? <laughs> they were just so stuck, or they were, or or to the point it did trigger a mental illness that it, it you know it's no longer about grief anymore. It's now a, a bigger problem. Hmm. I would say probably more prevalent with clients that I've had who maybe have had depression or anxiety because here's the thing I could have a wealth of knowledge and experience with mental illness and grief which I do and I could have all these cognitive strategies and I can have all these physical strategies I I could I I know what's going to make you better I would have a va- fair idea after two, three, four, five sessions, what the roadmap would be, what they need to do. But the biggest struggle is the person actually following through. Now, there's no blame attached here because depression is serious. It's a serious illness. And so no one can be blamed for you know, not having the ability to do the normal things, the regular everyday things, which people with intense depression struggle with, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say that that does come up because in the end, 
I can know what you need to do and you can know what you need to do sort of on a cognitive level, but you've got to implement it. You've got to do it. And it's hard, but unless you do, then you're going to suffer. Right. And I can relate to that. Um, I'm actually a suicide attempt survivor and I'm now five years sober. I've gone, you know, I've had my, my problems in the past and, you know, I'm, I'm still dealing with stuff, especially lately. Um, but I remember when I was really dark and I started first seeing a, a therapist or a psychologist or whatever he was, it was almost, it was almost, I was trying to make other people happy that I was going to see someone because I, I wasn't doing any of the work that they were giving me. So I was like, you know, I was blaming them. I was like, well, I'm going, he's not curing me. <laughs> you know? So again, they knew, they knew what I should be doing, but I just, I wasn't doing the work. And then I was blaming them for not fixing me, quote unquote. So yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. Um, and, and even now it's, uh, I've had a, a, my wife and a friend kind of pressure me to maybe go see someone again. And, uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious as to how that session will go if I actually do the work or not, because I'm not sure to be honest with you. It's like, I don't know if I'm ready. Maybe I just have to sit in my shit for a little longer before I'm ready. I don't know. But one thing that helps, it's a, it's a counselor that knows me, so because that trust is there, maybe I'll be more willing to actually do the work sooner than later. But anyway, that has nothing to do with grief. <laughs> First of all, um, I really applaud you for you know staying sober. And that's, that's a phenomenal achievement and surviving all the, all the adversity, which it sounds like you've been through. So that's, that's huge. Um, when, in terms of whether, you know, one can, one can actually uh, facilitate recovery uh, with, with mental illness or grief. Yes, a lot of it does boil down to inner will, uh, but there are other factors as well. So again, going back to the relationship with a therapist is, is really critical, but also the therapist, is, it's really important. So there are so many counsellors out there, there are so many therapists out there, there are so many psychotherapists out there and in the end it's about whether you click if you click then you become inspired then you become motivated if you know the the if i'm seeing somebody they've got to they've got to sort of find the work because it is work it's hard work it is that's what i'm scared of yeah it's like god damn it i've I've been working on my life just to not be miserable enough to do some more. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of it is, it's a bit like, um, you know, when you're, if you, if you're reading a good book or you're reading a book that you can't put down <laughs> because uh, it's to do with the sort of how taken in you are by the language and the style and the author and the scene they're setting. And so you know, it, it goes back to everything that we consume. You know, I, I consume and I have consumed over the last 30, 40 years, however long it is, so much content about mental illness and grief. And I've heard pretty much the same rhetoric from a thousand and one different people over the years. But there are certain people that because I've really connected with who they are as a person they're the people that have had the most impact and they're they're the people that um whose words i've remembered so it's it's all about you know the connection that we have with the, with the with the person who's trying to help us it is it's a vital ingredient in the recovery process because the opposite to feeling depressed is feeling connected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, I really, I really do believe that. I believe that if you are inspired by the person who's trying to help you, it's going to motivate you. Yeah. You know, if they come up with, if the strategies they come up with grab you, if they appeal to you, if they make you want to get out of bed and do them, 
that's really what it's about. One of my first therapists that I saw, he was pushing CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. And the way he did it, I mean, it was like reading the textbook. And I was like, I, I really poo-pooed it. I didn't like the idea of it. I was like, so you, I basically, you're asking me to trick myself into getting better is what it, is what it felt like. Um, and then years later, you know, I've kind of done some recovery. And then I went through addiction treatment and I was going to AA meetings and, uh, and I really liked the meetings. There was a lot of connection, a lot of inspiration there. And then uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who, who she's a social worker or, you know, she's a trained uh, therapist. I was like, wait a minute. You know, I kind of pieced the two together. It's like AA in a lot of ways is cognitive behavioral therapy in a lot of ways. But I just liked the the way they go about it more than sitting in a, uh, you know, in a... Cli- you know, very clinical kind of situation in a room with, you know, just one chair and a desk and <laughs> a guy telling me to read about it with fluorescent lights, you know, instead it was having coffee and connecting with people and listening to other people, you know, that peer group kind of setting um, was a lot better than, you know, one-on-one for me with just someone giving me instructions how to get better as opposed to seeing someone who lived, you know, has life experience. But but ultimately, it was, you know, a very cognitive behavioral therapy kind of stuff. So, yeah. So she's a, she's one of my friends that kind of pushed me into seeing another uh, therapist. And she's really telling me, you know, give CBT a, a chance. <laughs> and it's not that I'm not. It's just maybe it wasn't just the way he was doing it was a good way for me. He was also very faith-based um, uh, therapy, which which was a bit of a turnoff for me. But at the same time, allowed me to blame him for not fixing me. So it allowed me to keep being miserable and doing awful things. So <laughs> it was a bit of a scapegoat. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a couple of things I'd say to that. So for every, I've, I've, I've come across a lot of therapists and um, for various reasons. One, I've been in and out of therapy my whole life, first of all, to deal with the mental illnesses that. I had and I have, and also to deal with my grief, but also as part of my training and part of supervision. And hand on heart, I would say for every therapist that I connected with, another therapist I wouldn't connect with. So it's not easy. It's not easy finding a good therapist. Mm -hmm. And there are so many, for me, there are so many qualities that I'm looking for if I'm seeking therapy and that's not sounding sort of, you know, blase or sort of grandiose. It's just, if I'm going to be really vulnerable and I'm going to, you know, dig deep and um, communicate my deepest struggles, then they've, they've got to be the right person for me. Um, And the other thing I would say is that, a lot of the clients I've seen have had nightmare therapy stories yeah. uh, where, I mean, I, <laughs> I've heard the most extraordinary stories, which I, w- I won't bore you with, but. Oh, bore me with the best one you can think of. <laughs> I had a client and she had one counseling session with this person. And have you ever watched those chess games with the clocks? Mm-hmm. They have a clock and you, you push the clock down she brought one of these clocks and pressed the button down um, to time the session. Hmm. And I'd ne- I've never heard of, of that kind of a, <laughs> and I, I just would have walked out because, you know, so it, it is extraordinary, the, the stories I've heard. But um, what I was going to say is that uh, I, I have a lot of time for AA, actually. I, I used to sit in on a lot of the meetings just um, as part of my training. And there were two the two major things I took away from from those meetings. The first is that I loved the concept of, you know, grant me the serenity to serenity to accept the things I can't change. So it's it, it's a simple line, but it's so powerful because what you're doing is you're saying to yourself, I can't change this reality. I can't change this powerlessness. I can't change this loss. 
I can't change this depression, whatever it is. So let's seek out what I can control because I can't control everything else. So that line for me absolutely resonated. And the other factor that really grabbed me about AA was the fact that why they're so powerful is that you, you know, somebody who is struggling with addiction, they are sitting in that meeting rather than being somewhere else and drinking or using or whatever. So it's how they are physically spending their time. Mm -hmm. So for that hour or for that two hours, they're not doing X, Y, Z. And that's why it, you know, it's so powerful because it's a distraction. It's a positive distraction away from all the, the dangerous behaviors, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's alcohol addiction, whether it's drug addiction, sex addiction, whatever the addiction is. And that, that whole idea of getting together with a group of like-minded people in your situation rather than be out there doing X, Y, Z, that is what's so powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I know people that have gone through AA. So this is kind of getting away from the grief thing, but, and I thought like, oh man, they, you know, they're posting about it on Facebook and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, they're brainwashed. They joined a cult. And then once you start going and actually doing it, it's like, this is just good life skills in general. It's not about anything else. And it's just exciting to be in a room full of people that, are, you know, willing to help that, well, that's the 12th step is helping others. And then that's when you get like the, uh, you, you get a sponsor and whatnot, or you start sponsoring other people. But I, I also liked in the one, uh, one of the traditions is there's no outside talk about politics or, or whatever. It's just the matter at hand. And so there's no judging other people or, you know, you're like, eh, well, that guy's a real hardcore conservative. So I don't give a shit what he says. You know, there's none of that talk. So it's, it's, uh, it's easier to connect with someone you're connecting on that common ground. So, yeah. And, and even going, when I went through addiction treatment, I thought, man, addiction or not, I think everybody should just come through a place like this because it's just a long, good, long, hard look at yourself and, and you leave with what you need and, and the rest of the crap, you just leave here and it's just good life skills. So, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the program. (laughs) <laughs> I haven't been to a meeting in a couple of years because of COVID and I live in a small town, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's good stuff. I, I think it can be used for grief as well. Well, interestingly, you know, with grief, there is intense isolation, right? There's, you know, that sort of feeling like you're just like, there's nothing there. You're just empty. You're just completely alone. And one of the first things that I'll recommend to people, probably a little bit further down the line, not straight away, seek out a grieving community, right? Because Mm -hmm. they're going to be the people that get you. They're going to be the people that are living your reality or have lived your reality. And there's, there's nothing like having someone understand you. There's nothing like hearing somebody else's story that you can just, you know, oh God, yeah, I get this, you know, because what that does is it eliminates the feeling of isolation. You, you come to a point where you realize, actually, I'm, I'm not on my own. Mm-hmm. And also when we think about isolation, we, it doesn't necessarily mean you're physically isolated. Like, you know, f- for years and years, I, 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 was, I grew up feeling very, very isolated. I was a very lonely child. And even if I was in a crowd of people, even if I was in a family setting or if I was with friends, I still felt very isolated. So just because you're physically not isolated, you can still be emotionally isolated. And then again, having that peer group, you, have, you, you get to make connections. And like you said, the opposite of depression is connection. They say the opposite of addiction is connection as well. Gay, Gabor, I can't think oh, of Oh, yes. Gabor yeah, Martin. Yes, that's it. Yeah. C- Canadian guy. He That's his big thing. So, yeah. You you have such a, a soft, 
gentle way of speaking. I just could listen and talk to you for hours on end. <laughs> um, is, is there anything that I, I didn't ask that you, you wanted to add before I leave you alone? Um, well, just to say that, you know, with grief, you have different coping mechanisms for different stages. So in the early stages, they are very much about the physical grief, the shedding of the tears, the the feeling of the grief, the raw emotions, trying to get to grips with this sense of surrender. You know, I I have no choice. I've got to surrender to this. Um, But as, as time goes on, there are, there are things that you can do to maintain that connection with, with your loved ones. So you can have a keepsake box, a memento box, you know, things that uh, your loved one had, uh, possessions, stuff like that. Photographs, obviously, lighting a candle. One thing that um, I sometimes advise is to write a letter just an imaginary letter to the person you've lost. Obviously they're not, they're not going to receive it, but just to say, you know, I miss you so much. I love you so much. And I wish you were still here, but, and, and doing that, it can be very, very nourishing Mm -hmm. because even though, you know, that, your, that letter is obviously not going to get seen by your loved one. It's, it's again, your way of expressing yourself, you know, writing, writing just random thoughts down on a piece of paper can be very therapeutic. So it's interesting how, you know, different things help along the different stages of grief. It's really important. I think just to, to talk about grief, to talk about mental illness, because, there is still such a stigma attached to it. There's so much misunderstanding. There's so much invalidation. The more we talk about it, and you know, if you can just help one person out there, um, it's mission accomplished. So, thank you so much for that, David. Again, you're just one of the nicest people I've ever talked to, and uh, yeah, I really, really appreciate that you were able to do that all the way from London, even though all you have to do is sit in a chair and open your computer but still thank you so much for that and again next episode i'm talking to rachel from scotland and she suffered from agoraphobia and another type of phobia i can't remember what it's called she'll she'll explain it and i look forward to that now if you haven't yet now that it's the end of the episode you can just hit stop on the episode and and rate and review uh the podcast on apple and on spotify and whatever other app you might be listening to it on Uh, again i appreciate everyone listening and thank you so much and i'll catch you next episode thank you for listening and please subscribe rate and review however you are listening to this podcast it only takes a moment and it really helps the show out with getting noticed this episode has been sponsored by penny university bookstore 3104 13th Avenue. Call 639-571-2186 and check out their online bookstore at pennyu.ca. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is supported by Conexus. Wellness, however you define it, is achievable. You don't even need to figure it all out by yourself. Talk to Conexus. They'll give you guidance, motivation, and the push you need to reach your goals. They've got you. They're your financial partner and they know you can achieve your very best, your financial best. Prove them right. Start right at Conexus Credit Union. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is also sponsored by Direct West. Are you a business owner looking for new avenues to promote your business? Direct West digital billboards are a great opportunity to highlight a new product, new promotion, or anything else you'd like your customers to know about. You can get local expert marketing help for your business at directwest.com. If you are having a mental health crisis, please call the Canadian Crisis Number at 1-833-456-4566. In Saskatchewan, the mobile crisis team in Prince Albert is 306-764-1011. In Regina, it's 306-525-5333. And in Saskatoon, it's 306 
933-6200. Don't forget to check out my children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Sometimes Daddy Cries is told through the eyes of a boy whose father suffers from depression. He sees his dad get sad, rest, and even go to the hospital, all while comparing his father's depression to a physical ailment. Available on Amazon.ca. I'll see you next time. This is Todd Redebaum saying, make your beds and take your meds. Bye.